Is it even possible to comprehend the unfathomable truth behind the unspeakable events that took place in Nazi breeding farms? The stories that emerge from these dark chambers will leave you questioning humanity itself. What sickening things were happening on these farms? Get set to confront the unimaginable as we explore the haunting reality of Nazi breeding farms. In the realm of Nazi leaders, ensuring a future generation of racially pure offspring has been a central government policy since they seized power. On July 14, 1933, a law is enacted legalizing forced sterilization for individuals with genetic illnesses. Starting in 1935, Germans can only marry after obtaining a certificate from the health department, confirming the absence of hereditary diseases in their families. However, merely having the potential for healthy babies doesn't guarantee an increase in births. Germany faces a declining birth rate with a high number of terminated pregnancies. In 1930, a fertile woman had an average of two children, compared to four in 1910. But Reichsfuhrer SS, Heinrich Himmler, has a plan to reverse this trend. On his orders, the SS establishes the Lebensborn Association on December 12, 1935. Lebensborn, meaning fount of life, aims to encourage SS men and racially pure Aryan mothers to procreate. But how will this plan unfold? By eliminating common barriers to parenthood, such as financial constraints and limited medical resources, the association aims to support expectant mothers. Through the establishment of nurseries where mothers can give birth and stay with their children, Lebensborn provides welfare assistance. The organization's funding comes from private donations, the National Socialist Welfare Organization, and membership fees from SS men. Remarkably, nearly half of the beneficiaries are married to SS or SA men, while the other half are unmarried. Despite the belief held by many Nazi leaders that single mothers are socially and racially impure, Heinrich Himmler disagrees. Under his guidance, Lebensborn offers unmarried mothers the opportunity to conceal their pregnancies. The association fabricates false birth certificates, classifying them as widowed or divorced, and even keeps the identity of the father a secret, assuming guardianship of the child. These children can reside in association nurseries until their mothers are prepared to care for them independently. Lebensborn assists the mothers in finding employment and negotiates alimony payments with the fathers. In cases where the child cannot be cared for, the association helps locate suitable adoptive or foster families. On August 15, 1936, a significant chapter begins as the first Liebenborn nursery emerges in Steinhering, Bavaria. Initially equipped with 30 beds for mothers and 55 for children, the facility will witness its capacity double by 1940. However, it is crucial to understand that Heinrich Himmler's motives are far from benevolent. The nursery serves as a breeding ground for a new Aryan generation, subjecting prospective mothers to rigorous assessments of purity, hereditary health, personal history, and more. Life within these walls is stringent, demanding women to contribute to household chores and undergo childbirth without pain relief, all while being compelled to breastfeed their infants. Non-compliance results in expulsion, stripping illegitimate children of secrecy, guardianship, and protection. The behavior of obedient women is closely monitored, with the nursery's director and head nurse grading them based on various criteria. These evaluations, along with detailed questionnaires, are meticulously stored by Himmler for future use when Germany is ready to shape its new elite. The highest-ranking mothers are likely to partake in the SS name-giving ritual, replacing traditional christening. Here they are asked to raise their children in alignment with the National Socialist worldview, while an SS member assumes the role of the child's godfather pledging to uphold the mother's oath. The ceremony culminates in the chilling ritual of the dagger. Lebensborn homes team with overcrowded conditions, housing nearly two and a half times more children than originally planned. As a result, the level of care provided is shockingly low. Vulnerable children suffer from the rapid spread of diseases like whooping cough and pneumonia. During a visit to one of the homes in the summer of 1940, Dr. Wilhelm Fannenstiel, an advisory doctor, reports, Almost all had crusted noses. Many had scratches on their faces and hands. The babies were wrapped in badly washed gray ragged diapers. Child mortality rates soar within the Lebensborn, although the true extent is difficult to ascertain due to suspected manipulation of numbers by the organization. Independent estimates suggest it could be as high as 8%. Nonetheless, as the Third Reich expanded its influence, so did the reach of the Lebensborn. Nurseries emerge in Norway, France, Belgium, and Luxembourg all aligned with Heinrich Himmler's vision to propagate the world with his warped ideals of Aryan perfection. Norway, in particular, captures Himmler's enthusiasm, 
as Norwegian women are deemed sufficiently Nordic to bear desirable Aryan offspring. High-ranking SS officers ensure that the men are aware of this fact. Unlike in other occupied territories, rape is not institutionalized within the Lebensborn program and is severely punished. However, the organization pays little attention to whether the child is born out of wedlock. In the spring of 1941, the Lebensborn establishes 10 nurseries for pregnant women. Throughout the war, approximately 8,000 Norwegian women will pass through the association, giving birth to roughly 6,000 children. The women have little choice but to comply as bearing a child with a German mark them as treacherous collaborators. Ultimately, between 200 and 250 of these children will be sent to the Reich for adoption. However, the deportation doesn't solely target children with German fathers. On February 19, 1942, Himmler issues an order to abduct children who, in his words, are acknowledged as carriers of valuable blood. The purpose is to Germanize these children. Polish children selected for Germanization are transported to specialized children's concentration camps in Brokow and Kalisz, where they undergo examinations by Lebensborn health officials. Those under six years old are provided with forged birth certificates bearing German names. They are then subjected to re-education aimed at erasing any ties to their Polish heritage. Some are transferred to Lebensborn nurseries in Germany, where further examinations take place. If they are considered sufficiently German, they are put up for adoption. If not, they are returned to Poland, often back to the camp system and occasionally to extermination facilities. The exact number of abducted children across Eastern Europe during the war remains unclear, though estimates suggest it could reach 250,000. Only a few thousand of them pass through the Lebensborn adoption system, while the others meet a tragic fate. As 1942 progresses, the Nazis realize that the war will be far longer than anticipated and the loss of men will be substantial. Himmler grows concerned about the future of his SS. On August 15, 1942, he sends them back home with the mission to father as many children as possible, declaring, it is your duty to ensure as quickly as possible that you are no longer the last sons. Meanwhile, amidst the turmoil of war, efforts are made to address the growing gender imbalance. Reichsgesundheitsführer Leonardo Conti shares his proposal with Himmler suggesting artificial insemination and government-organized matchmaking to encourage procreation. The unmarried women would receive support from the Lebensborn program during and after pregnancy. However, Himmler dismisses these plans due to the ongoing war. Nevertheless, in late 1943, the SS establishes the Race and Settlement Main Office to facilitate extramarital procreation, albeit with limited success. On March 9, 1943, a harsh anti-abortion law takes effect, imposing the death penalty for abortions and related activities. Meanwhile, the Lebensborn program, driven by their pursuit of racially valuable infants, provides shelter to legally required pregnant Aryan women. However, the overall impact of Lebensborn remains relatively small. By the war's end, approximately 12,000 children are born in German nurseries and 6,000 in Norway leading to stigmatization and oppression for those born in Norway. Many Lebensborn mothers and their children will seek refuge in Sweden, including Ani Frid Lingstad, who will later achieve global fame as one of the members of the iconic pop group ABBA. Her journey will shed light on the challenges faced by children born through the Nazi progeny program, serving as a testament to their struggles. Contrary to the Nazis' grand ambitions, the grim reality reveals that their quest to breed a new race was nothing more than a futile fantasy. The SS's assistance aside, both the German and global populations experienced a rapid rebound after the war, thanks to the baby boom era. Ironically, even this significant increase in post-war births failed to satisfy Germany's economic growth. Between 1955 and 1973, Germany opened its doors to 14 million guest workers from various countries, including Italy, Spain, Greece, Turkey, Morocco, Portugal, Tunisia, and Yugoslavia. Today, their contributions to diversity and innovation have played a vital role in making Germany one of the world's most prosperous nations. The haunting truth about Nazi breeding farms sheds light on the unimaginable horrors inflicted on innocent lives. These unspeakable events from history evoke deep emotions and serve as a poignant reminder of the importance of never forgetting.